our panel on integrating streaming video, confer streaming video conferencing and unified communication solutions. Uh, so I'm George LeVar, and I'm the video services lead for Accenture. So what that big title means is that I own the operations and engineering of our webcasting, streaming delivery, as well as video conference and telepresence environments across Accenture's global footprint. Um, yeah, so I think that, and I think this is a very interesting topic. I've, I've got a, a great panel here with me. You'll I'll let them introduce themselves to you as we, we go along a bit. But you know, I think it's a very interesting topic because enterprises are bringing video into more and more aspects of their business, right, to their customers, their potential customers, their employees. You add to that, you have a mobile workforce and people work from home. Add on to that the proliferation of multiple mobile devices, the bring your own device, BYOD model, so you don't really have a standard enterprise platform anymore. Add on to that the changing development of codecs, right? You've got SVC, you've got MPEG Dash, you've got whatever else is out there, and the challenges of interoperability between things like Microsoft Link, Skype, Google Video, traditional endpoints. And then also you have the, the challenge that people go home and they watch CNN on their iPad and it looks great. And so, you know, Accenture, a company of almost 300,000, our CEO would like to look something like the CEO, like the uh, CNN newscaster on the web. So just a guy in a blank room doesn't cut it. Um, so with all of this, it's easy to end up with kind of this unified communications thing as not being really quite so unified in, in the real world. Um, so the, the panel here comes from a, a wide variety of experience, you know, from the vendor side, from others in the trenches with me dealing with enterprise video and implementing it. Um, I'm going to take, take my prerogative as moderator for just a moment to kind of show you, give you a sense that Accenture has traveled this road. Um, you know, give you like two minutes, the two-minute history of 15 years, 13 years, from 1999, the standard CEO broadcast, and then there for all the big events of Accenture's corporate history. Right? These were all the big events, right? Sat feeds, hundred, you know, dozens of people, months of planning, um, you know, the big events. About in 2008, Accenture began the collaboration program. This was a broad initiative inside the company, everything from revamping the corporate portal to changing how employees know what skill sets each other have so they can staff, get staffed on the right client projects, very wide ranging. But one of the biggest pieces that's been longest lasting in it is video. To take things like Link and Telepresence and now other video conferencing products out to everybody in the enterprise. Right, so we have thousands of video conference meetings a month, hundreds of endpoints. Ex executives use these tools every day. But the extra value that comes is when you pull all of this collaboration investment into the webcast. Right? You're extending the value of your telepresence in VC units. And it really takes webcasting out from being this little niche thing on the side that you roll out when the CEO has a big broadcast and you bring it into something that everybody uses literally every day, multiple times a day. Um, just to mention, we had a, our, our mix of events. Before we had telepresence integrated, 90% of our events were audio only. Now, this slide's old, that's probably more like 80, 85% are video events. And we've done 100 of those this month. Um, a little history, that's where we started. Actually, literally, as we speak, my team is tearing apart that room because we don't need it anymore because we have that, which is where we deliver our events from. All right, so I like to say that we stand at the intersection of broadcast and IT. All right, we, when you're doing 100 events a month, you're a broadcaster. And so enterprises have to think about integrating video together in that way. And we also have a little room in Prague because we're global. 
We have to do this at all time zones. And tomorrow I'm securing space for a facility in India. Right? Accenture has 70,000 people in India. You have to be able to do these events from there as well. And be redundant. So I've used enough time. <laughs> I've used enough time for myself here. And so I want to start posing some questions to all the, the great panelists I've got here. You know, one of the one of the key things that we've seen is the the idea that these have to be productions and bringing more value, more high value television production content into the webcast and streaming world. And you know, we've got Philip here from NewTek, who's certainly part of that whole or that whole um, that whole area. And so I want to direct the first question to him in terms of how you've seen other enterprises getting into that area of, of taking webcasting to the next level of content, and then anybody else can weigh in as well. Lots of pressure being the first question. Um, yeah. You know, the thing that, that, as you mentioned earlier, you know, we live, in a, we live in a world of television experts. Everyone in this room knows what TV looks like. Every one of your kids, if you have kids, knows what TV looks like. And so one of the most important aspects that we see is that you, in order for your message to have credibility, it has to look good. It's like a brochure. You know, you make your brochures look top-notch so that you're, the message you're trying to convey is accepted in a professional way. And the same, is, it, it's the same goes for, for broadcasting. I mean, if you have a, a, a national or international brand that's worth millions of dollars, why on earth would you put your CEO in front of a dirty sheet with a single webcam and make it look like dorm room video on YouTube? You know, it has to look like broadcast television so that, you know, the, the, you don't want the production of your, your webcasting to take away from the, from the message. And so, you know, that, at New Tech, that has always been our premise that it has to look like broadcast television. And, and also in the corporate environment, as, as you mentioned, you know, you have to be nimble. You don't know where these webcasts are going to take place. So portability for us was also a big factor. So if you look in the back of the room, there's a TriCaster sitting on that little, right under the camera, tripod. You know, so they just you can set it up anywhere and actually do a webcast. Um, an example is one of our clients is FedEx. And you know, FedEx was doing a, a VP um, roundtable in India. And they shipped a TriCaster over there and did a live webcast that went out to all their employees, but it was also broadcast satellite so that it reaches their um, employees where they want to watch it. Because so, some of the drivers don't have computer access, so they have to go you know, watch it somewhere where, where that webcast can be viewed. But you know, to, to a long answer to a very simple question, you know, we feel the most important thing is, is the, the, the quality of the, 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 the show that you're creating needs to look like broadcast television because if it doesn't, you look like you know college kids in a dorm room. Anybody else? So just quickly Simpler building there. on that, and it might be worth a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Mike Newman. I'm vice president and uh, GM of the video content management business unit within Polycom, and I think the introduction is worthwhile uh, because I know very little about video conferencing. I actually was formerly the CEO <laughs> of Accordant Technologies, uh, which was very, very heavily invested in the development of uh, rich media content creation uh, solutions as well as video content management and rich media management solutions. So that's my pedigree, and, and right now I exist as sort of a, a streaming island within a much larger organization that's transforming into a unified communications company. But just adding to what you were saying, I think historically the tension has been between quality and speed or quality and quantity, and I do think the solutions are, are meeting that and solving that tension and that the new tension we're seeing in, in large organizations is between really quality and quantity on the one side and comprehensiveness and intelligence on the other side. So as you bring together all these different UC solutions, how many are you able to collect and capture and ingest and make it easier for people to find those subject matter experts make it easier for them to find the exact piece of content they want and really get the metrics around that. So it's almost a third dimension on, on what was historically a two-dimensional tension. Um, yeah, so um, let me go ahead and introduce myself. My, I'm Mike Chop. Um, I'm kind of here on my own today, but come with a long background in enterprise implementations for uh, collaboration programs. 
Um, the topic that we're actually talking about in terms of quality and making things look like broadcast is actually one that we have in our enterprise um, all the time. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of the devil's view here and say I think that there is a place for producing stuff that looks highly, uh, that looks like broadcast quality, um, lighted well, things that, are, that have great audio, that look like television. Um, on the other side of that, I equally think that there's definitely a place for content that looks more, um, you know, to put, in, to put in other words, more YouTube-ish, stuff that looks like that it's content generated on the fly that looks like it's user generated. Um, for situations like this, um, I think it's important to encourage people to develop their own content and to eliminate that barrier of having to walk into a studio or to get um, an AV crew to actually generate something that looks very produced, um, but to be able to, um, on the context of having great content and great passion and um, talking about information that's very close to the presenter. Um, you know, products like Polycom and Accordant where um, remote sites can develop their own content and not be afraid that it's perfect looking, but it's very compelling and engaging because the people that are producing the content are very passionate and are the knowledge owners who can communicate that to the community. So I think the thing that I want to kind of um, relay to you is really is that you, know, you need to know your community and you need to know what type of content works with that community and, what, and uh, what's best to, uh, to disseminate the information to them. Okay, yeah, and I think this, this leads into kind of the, the core of, of this topic, and that is that uh, enterprises, especially like Accenture, we have video conference and telepresence units spread all around our executives as well as you know, everybody in the company uses these devices every day for person to person real-time collaboration meetings. And the power of bringing these together is that for these end users, talking to 14,000 people in their business unit is the same as walking to the telepresence room for the meeting they have with their direct reports earlier in the day. They do absolutely nothing different. We do all the hard work in the back end to bring the two together. And you know, I, I think there's, there's kind of two levels of, of integration here, and I, I know we've got different points of view across the panel on these that you know, there's the functional kind of from the, the end user perspective of bringing these two together to make video conference flow into webcasting and broadcasting, not necessarily at the protocols and bits and bytes level, but at the level of making it transparent for the users. Then there's the next layer under that, which is how you might in the future bring all these pieces together into something that's a more you know, deeply technical integration. And you know, I, I was going to direct this question at, uh, at Mike here since you, know, you come from the accordant, from the webcasting background, now part of a video conferencing company. So I think that it gives you a good perspective on how these two work together and what you might be seeing at other enterprises. You'd think. No. You would think. <laughs> um, you know, I, I always looked at it and I continue to look at it, and I believe Polycom looks at it as a practical challenge and a strategic challenge. And so every time you make an investment in a piece of hardware or software, if you're able to dual purpose that product uh, and derive more value from that product, that's a practical benefit. And so you invest in a high definition endpoint, um, why not be able to convert that also for dual purpose into a studio environment? I mean, it just makes, in most environments, practical sense. And that was something that at Accordant and continuing to do at Polycom, we focus on it, and a lot of companies do, which is really just grabbing that video conference, transcoding it, and making it ar archivable. And it's an acknowledgement that whatever content's being transferred, or at least some fraction of it, deserves to be archived. That's something almost anybody can, can just solve and assess and, and walk through their rooms and walk along the desktops and see where do they want to capture content and what additional investments do they want to make. Strategically, it's a far different challenge, and it's unique to each organization, and it's in the hierarchy of our communications, in the hierarchy of our business challenges, what do we want to do? And it might be that Yammer is the most important thing that you have to communicate on, and you do very little video conferencing, and your webcasting is four times a year. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that by definition. Um, you know, it is what it is, but what we look to do 
is enable different hierarchies. If all your communications are going to be driven initially by telepresence, by an endpoint, by a webcast, by a studio in a box or a capture appliance, how can you leverage those within an environment where you extract the most value? And, and it might seem a little bit abstract just talking about value and decentralized and centralized, but ultimately the way I would look at it is for most public corporations, for large organizations, how can you do something that translates into an Excel spreadsheet and a measurable impact? And at that point, it becomes strategic. And, and so if you're running a training initiative, if you're running a corporate communications initiative, you're running, could be town hall, emergency response, how are you aggregating the information you need to understand whether or not you're being successful? So that's... I mean, in Polycom, they're trying to do that in a holistic way. At, at, at Accordant, we tried to do that in a very boutique way, understanding we are just one element in the ecosystem. But I would encourage you know, most of you who are driving these as initiatives and not as events to take a step back and, and look at you know, what are the success metrics that are driving those initiatives, how are they defined, how are they captured, because I can assure you, and it, and it doesn't need to be Polycom, you know, there are a lot of different ways of, of slicing this, um, it's something you should be doing because ultimately most of these things will percolate up to a finance department uh, and you hopefully have a defensible and, and, and very commendable piece of data to show them. Yeah. Sid, you want to yeah, comment I, on this? I, uh, my name is Sid Isbell and I work as a video solutions architect for WellPoint. Uh, we're actually a large healthcare company. And um, I probably come from a different perspective. I'm the guy who wants to make it all work together, so I really think about Building, building those solutions, those ecosystems where you, you, know, you take your UC foundation and then you put video conferencing with it and then you put a broadcast system. And my, my goal is to create a unified solution where you can push, pull, you can acquire from anything and push content in anything. So you have even like your web meeting stuff, you know, where you've got a bunch of people out there that are on the web and you want to be able to push it out there. Uh, so you don't have any barriers and you don't have any limitations. And I think in, the, in this new world where um, you know, a lot of companies are really reaching out to the consumer and you're having to work with things like Skype or you're federating your IM. You really want to think about moving all that into a video arena and it becomes really complicated, right? Because there's all kinds of proprietary protocols. And I want to salute Polycom as one of the companies that's actually creating things like the <laughs> OVCC and trying to interoperate with as much as possible. So I think they're, they're doing a great job. Uh, but it, this takes a lot of thought to create these ecosystems that will actually allow you to do all the things you want to do in business today. Yeah, exactly. And I, I also, you know, Accenture as well as a lot of companies, you know, we're hearing a lot about BYOD, bring your own device, which to, to me, I, I translate that as BYOD equals B to C, right? It just means that the Cs happen to be your employees too. But from the standpoint of how you, how you have to approach the reach of your content, you say, well, it's just my employees. Well, yeah, but they could have any device under the sun. And, you know, and so how do you address those types of challenges then around, you know, is it Android, which version do they have? Is it iOS, which version? You know, do they have Flash? Do you want to do this in HTML5? Well, then you have to be worried about a bunch of other things. So, so it, it really does become a complex issue. But I think the, you know, to kind of bring it back to, to the topic at hand here is that in Accenture, we didn't, I didn't have to justify the cost of the studios as such, right? The studios were justified by travel cost savings, right? Accenture did a big analysis and looked at, you know, who travels between which city pairs and where should you put big telepresence units and things like that, you know, which client projects are in which places and need video capability. So that investment's justified already. So it lets us from the streaming side focus on how we can simply add value to an investment that's already made, which is certainly a lot easier than having to start from the ground up you know, and write something from a blank piece of paper. If anybody has any, any comments on how you might have gone through something like that in, in your own companies, or if you have. Well, I mean, from our perspective, from the vendor's perspective, I, I, I feel sorry for our product managers. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, they're accustomed to driving a vision, and now they're responding to something that's already occurred, and it's happening very, very quickly. So I think, you know, in many ways, 
the, the innovation has transformed into a greater sense of listening uh, and, and being observant. And for us as a, a technology vendor, certainly, you know, it would be hard to hold ourselves out as a thought leader if we weren't doing this stuff internally. And, and so that's a challenge on, on our product management as well. Um, so, I mean, one of the thoughts that I had about um, inside the enterprise, particularly when it comes to BYOD, um, is uh, as you're thinking about how you're going to be doing these initiatives and the initiatives that you decide to tackle, um, it can be very daunting to, to try to do too much. Um, for example, if for on the mobile side has been a great example of that, right? Um, as iOS devices started to permeate in the consumer side, enterprises were pretty reluctant and slow and, and tried to put up a bunch of barriers to try to slow that down. And what really happened was as, as the consumer um, desire for these devices built up, there was no way for enterprise to really hold off on that anymore. And right now we're kind of in that cycle where um, enterprise may or may not own these devices and we're pushing proprietary data um, from your enterprise into these personal devices. Um, so, you know, you know, with, with tools like New Tech and Polycom even, we have the ability to do multi-streams, right? So we can push to lots of different devices and we can push to things that are owned by the enterprise and aren't owned by the enterprise. Um, but I think the, thing, the thing that you really need to think about, and this goes back to initiatives and not events, is really think about whether or not you should. So strategically, for example, should you push to employee-owned devices? Or strategically, should you push out data and have control over the devices to spike them if they're lost? And I think these are the kinds of questions that as you start to think about it strategically and answer them, they kind of drive your direction and what you're going to be doing and how your initiatives pan out in the enterprise. You know, I'd like to add something to that. You know, and Michael kind of said this, but you know, I think a trap that I, I see clients falling into is they want to dictate and control every aspect of how that data is distributed and consumed, and sometimes they forget to deliver the content in a meaningful way that the in a way that the employees want it. And an example is, you know, like you mentioned Yammer. If some companies say we're going to communicate through Yammer and no one checks Yammer, then it's a waste. You know, and, and the same can be said for any, you know, streaming, you know, if you're not delivering it to a device or site or location where your employees will actually view it, then it's a waste of time. So, you know, so many times you get caught up in the the, the the IT side of it and what's feasible and, and instead of really trying to determine what do people want. So for me, you know, I start to think about two-way video and I think about the, the bring your own device is immeasurably more complex when you're doing two-way video. Um, it's, you know, much easier to just decode video than have to also encode it, right? So uh, I go back to picking platforms that are, again, going to allow you to do all the things you want to do. Like, you want to get it out to Yammer, great. Where is your source, and how are you going to acquire that source? And then what kind of applications are you going to write, like, for the mobile platforms to enable to deliver that? And what other tools are you going to align up next to it? Like, maybe they want to be able to text chat during this big broadcast, right? Well, how are you going to do that, right? So there's all these things you need to think about besides just delivering a stream or delivering a piece of content. And that's, that's where I'm trying to go. I'm in an innovation center in my company, and so we're trying to think of what's the next thing that's going to be happening, right? Um, I think it's multimedia and multi-channel communication. So this video stuff that we're doing in the enterprise is going to start moving out into the consumer space. And so what was traditionally an island, right? This big thought around, you know, you've got your video conferencing, and, and it's this island, right? It's, it's owned by the enterprise, and it really doesn't go beyond your border except maybe for some B2B stuff, and maybe you've got the, some company that allows you to dial so-and-so. Well, that whole model is going to change, right? Because now we've got all kinds of companies that are providing that capability, whether it's Skype or it's FaceTime or whatever it is, uh, with all these consumers, and now we need to interface with that. So it opens up this enterprise environment to huge scalability issues and all kinds of interop, and it's a whole new world. So. Yeah, and the, you know, it, it, it sort of comes down to know your customer, right? I mean, you know, for instance, in, right, in Accenture, yeah, Accenture business units are not required to use the service that we provide for streaming, right? 
They use us because we provide what they want at a price point they want and in a way that's easy for them to use. If we didn't, they would go off and find somebody else and take it to our leadership and say, you got to make this, you know, hey, leaders, make this work. <laughs> and, right, and we would have no business. Right, so, right, so inside Accenture, it really is a business that, that we run. And knowing your customers, knowing what your marketing and communications teams inside want to do with streaming, how they use video conference already, how they use Link or any of these other pieces of corporate video communications. And you really have to kind of step back and think about how you could make their lives easier by pulling all these pieces together, you know, again, either in a technical automated way or you know, like, like we do in the, in the broadcast center in Chicago, we convert everything to, S to HD SDI. And we put it into a big broadcast grade router, video router. And we do all the switching and CG and everything, and then we convert it back out to wherever it has to go. Now, this is very different than, than Sid's view of everything is in one codec and moves all around. But it, it addresses one of the other challenges that I think we have, and that is that things are changing quickly. And you either, in the enterprise, you have to either be prepared to change very quickly as things go, or you kind of get stuck in analysis because by the time you're done analyzing, the market's moved on and now the product is different and the feature set is different and then what do people want to do? And so the way, the way that I went about it at Accenture is to just say, we're going to integrate this but not try to go too deep on it. We're going to take it all to broadcast standards, do the interchange there, and then convert back into the IT world. Right. So, you know, so again, you know, kind of the concept of right, that we we're at the intersection of broadcast and IT, and you have to be able to kind of look both ways down that road and understand how to what's the best way to pull it together for your enterprise. I guess that's, that's not sort of a question, but if anybody has any experience in, in kind of looking at things that way, you know, you you said something that I I thought was interesting, and it, it's paralysis by analysis where you can plan and think and plan and think and plan and think and never do anything. And, and you know, and I see this in broadcast because in New Tech we work with everyone from the NBA and the NHL and MTV to big businesses and, and, and brands. And it's funny, in the enterprise world, so much emphasis is put on, you know, return on investment and strategic planning. Sometimes they don't do anything. And, and, and so you do have to find the balance of get started. You know, if, if you want to start streaming a CEO message to your employees, you don't have to have the perfect infrastructure to start because really you can start for free. Of course, I wish everyone would buy a TriCaster and do it that way, but you can start with a, a MacBook Pro and a webcam and start getting content out there. And then, you know, you want to, I, my view is it needs to look like broadcast television, but that's just my view. You know, and, and so the advice I always give people is, you know, try it. You know, don't, don't get scared by how big the infrastructure needs to be to be perfect. You know, it, it, it doesn't have to be at this point. I, I would like to know how many people in here are doing streaming right now? So pretty much everybody. Wow, okay. Two hands didn't go up. Yeah, those two right there. <laughs> Tough crowd. They're going to get heckled when they leave. Uh, yeah. It can mean a lot. Oh, yeah, well, in my view, um, I'm not talking telepresence. I was talking about streaming to employees' content, you know, you live. live, yes. Live streaming. live streaming. Okay, thank you for asking that question. How yeah. many people do live streaming? Okay, that's, that's okay. actually a much more meaningful question. Thank you. <laughs> how many, I'd like to know how many do video, archive video that's... On demand? To, on demand? What do you call it? On demand? straw poll. It's much more challenging, actually. So I think live is fairly straightforward. I think on-demand is much more challenging in the enterprise, my, my opinion. But uh, Is it the content management that's the challenge? Because, I mean, what makes it a challenge? I think it's distributing across your network because you can easily break your network with a lot of odd because it's all unicast. So right. 
I think it's managing that, guessing what your utilization will be, who's going to request it, you don't know where, are they going to be on-prem, are they going to be on a mobile device, it's, con it's putting in the right container. There's just a, a lot of challenges around VOD, where I, I, I think live streaming, especially if you can enable multicast, it's fairly straightforward, and it's not very expensive. But uh, VOD is, I think, much more a challenge. Interesting. Yeah, I think that VOD is, in the enterprise that we had built out when we were starting to look at um, lecture capture um, and products like Accordance, it was, a, it was a critical piece for us to have that VOD piece built in for us. Um, so, and especially when starting out, you know, live is pretty straightforward. People know how to do that. Um, it was a big chasm for us to figure out what to do with that content after it was over. We didn't, um, in our case, we didn't want post-production we wanted the people that develop the content on their own to go ahead and clip it and fix it, you know, replace slides and that type of thing. And we really, it was important to our enterprise that that process was simple enough um, that we could, you know, we could ship a box out or people could develop content on their own and really go for that user generated, and here's that buzzword, right, enterprise YouTube um, is trying to figure out what that solution is, is so people will be encouraged to develop their own content and build up that library of, uh, of uh, expertise and really get that information pushed out to the community in a meaningful way, in a, in a quick way. Yeah. So in our community, it was really the thing. The thing that kind of pushed our organization over the edge was lecture capture. Um, we come from a highly engineering-centric company, um, so uh, where documentation is critical for our product release cycles. So it was important for our engineers to be able to produce lecture, uh, essentially uh, PowerPoint-based content, and to get that produced quickly. Um, so the ability to set up set up a lecture capture system, uh, record that, have it sent up to the server and encoded, and 10 minutes later you have something that's out there um, that people can watch around the world running off our internal CDN um, was pretty invaluable to us. Um, that the ability to turn something around from live to VOD, you know, within 10, 20 minutes is was critical for us. Um, in our case, we did not do transcription. Um, that was an interesting point, though, because we were a worldwide company. So the ability, we were, and this goes to a question that we were actually all talking about, was, um, was APIs. So when we were looking for a solution, one of the important things that we, features that we were looking for is, uh, was a robust API that would allow us to do things like transcript, uh, transcription and translation as we needed to do it. I think you bring up a good point around um, being able to search for content. We were just talking about this at lunch, around being able to, you know, generate an index or maybe a speech-to-text transcription. Or, I mean, now the industry is going towards, you know, speech analytics, right, where you can actually just analyze speech rather than having to convert it to text and do things like phonetic, uh, phonetic analysis or even emotional content analysis. I mean, we're coming into these new arenas. Uh, so I think uh, our speech rec or facial recognition, right, we're talking about that. Um, so I think that's kind of the next generation, right? What, how, how can you analyze that content just like any other data, right? Because now we're getting these large data models and everybody wants to analyze co content, right? So I think it's a new, a new thing that's going to emerge that will be very interesting for this industry, Dad. question is what kind of tools are we using? Well, I mean, I'll talk from our experience. I mean, we're actually rolling out a vBrick solution. So we're rolling out a solution that um, allows us to do on-prem, live, and video on demand as well as in the cloud. So it, it very nicely services all those people that are in office as well as the people that are working at home with some split tunneling. So you got to do a little bit of working with your info security teams. Uh, but it also does things like you can put an appliance at the edge that allows you to, um, you know, take H.264 and then deliver it to all those mobile devices at the edge. So you have one file. You don't have to transcode it into a million different formats or a million different uh, bit rates. You just stick it out there, and it does a lot of that on an automated, uh, automated level with a centralized management. And the other nice thing about it is you don't need a lot of network intervention to deploy it. So that's us. 
and yeah, we use more. We use a flash and HLS. My H.264 codec. Yeah, flash to the desktop on laptops, and then HLS out to the i devices. Um, we're still coming to grips with what BYOD will mean to the entire infrastructure and, and how we address that. You know, and, and I guess, you know, as others have said about BYOD, sometimes you have to, to ask the question of, do you need to be delivering to every single person on every single device they might bring? Right? You know, is, is that a reasonable expectation? Can you test to that level? Do you have access to all the devices you need to test with? You know, or do you have to make some, some reasonable guess? Right? I mean, in an enterprise, chances are you probably know how many people sync with your email from their iDevice versus an Android device. Right? So that, that can at least give you some sense of proportionality in terms of what types of devices you need to be dealing with. As a viewer or as a participant in the conference, as a presenter? As a participant. Okay, as a viewer. <laughs> so, okay, so, so, the, so the question is, you've got telepresence rooms, you've got the in-office video conference and telepresence systems, but you have people that are not there in the office and they want to be part of these meetings. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? For us, we actually deliver that live stream from our, from our prem where we have an encoder. We deliver it out to a cloud-based solution. They connect to the company through an SSL VPN. They authenticate so we can validate they have permission to view this corporate content. We don't want anybody to view it. And then based upon their IP address, they're actually redirected to the cloud. Right, but that's, that, but, yeah, but you're talking about two-way VC. Yeah, two-way oh. two VC, yeah, it, that's okay. you know, essentially yeah, that's a like whole other arena. Yeah, Boy, that's, like a that's video a, conference client on your PC, essentially. I wish I could answer that question. Well, actually, Polycom just made a great new announcement that they're actually moving okay. to a web-based solution. And from my opinion, yeah. the way to go, instead of supporting, like you look at your average blue jeans, for example, where they're going to support a bunch of different clients and they're going to transcode for you. I think the future is to support presence in all these different systems. Like I can see your presence in Skype and I can see your presence in Google Chat. But I send you an URL and when you click on that URL, it launches a common web-based plugin that allows us all to participate in the video conference. That's much easier than having to transcode it all, right? And I think that's exactly where Polycom's going, where they're going to move to an SVC web-based solution. And I think that's where the future of two-way video is moving. So if we can settle on a, on a, like a codec, right, for, that everybody's going to use, maybe it's 265 or who knows what it is, but if we can settle on that and use it in UC and use it in video conferencing and use it in streaming, now you have a highly unified, interoperable system where you can acquire, you can broadcast, you can record, you can save it for later, and you have very common systems to support all that. that we're not there at all today, so it's very hard to build these ecosystems today that all work together. Yeah, I was going to add, that is going to be a place of tremendous innovation. Um, you know, it kind of goes back to a little bit to bring your own device, which is at some point you acknowledge the democracy out there and you try to at least address each individual individually. Um, and, and as you alluded to, we did make a major announcement on October 9th regarding this, and I'd be happy to give you more information if you want to come up afterwards. Yeah, and that, that, is, a major, that is a major challenge, especially when you then have to say, well, you know, we're on such and such a bridge for this call. Can the Skype client you have on your PC talk to this bridge at this point? So yeah, it is a, it is a major challenge. Uh, one other thing is with mobile devices, right? You, you can't do web-based clients on a mobile device yet. So you have to do some sort of mobile library. So that, the mobile arena is, is a very challenging area. But if you're on PC or Mac, I think today there are even viable yeah. solutions to do those web-based common plug-in solutions, even with Flash, if you don't require really high quality video, but but that's, I really feel like that's where the, the solutions are going, and you look at things like Windows-based tablets and, you know, the new Windows 8 stuff, 
and it, it will, will probably support a web-based solution, for example, right? So I think that's going to be our next jump. Yeah. Question over here. Uh, <coughs> I've done some video conferencing and with Skype, and I've done audio teleconferencing. <coughs> one guy with one device and uh, music in the background or an interru work interruption can dominate a whole meeting mm -hmm. if you're unable to mute it. So I, I'm asking, I'm going to make it a, a broader question. Uh, I remember at one streaming video conference there was a presentation that I rattled around in my head and played out in my experience. And that was how many conferences really need to be live streamed and how many are better off just being recorded and placed on demand. And uh, the, the, the question played out in our experience too. I think a, far and away, most conferences, what you're after is timeliness and not live streaming. If you want live streaming, it's because you need questions, you need immediate answers, you need votes from the audience. You want to see, you know, you want, you want live participation. You need live participation to, to deliver the message. In most cases, uh, there are so many ways that can be destroyed and interrupted, bandwidth problems, so, you know, a guy doesn't hit his mute button when he takes a huge question and he's have a, or he's tuning out an employee. You know, I mean, there's so many ways that can be disrupted. Would you care to comment on how, on how you enforce or how you decide whether you actually use live streaming and how many of those be recorded and timely, timely presented? So for the for the recording, so the, the question really is what what types of events are more appropriate for live streaming versus on demand? You know, how, how often do you really need that level of interactivity that a live event brings versus recording it and people can watch it the next day, the next hour? I thought Michael hit on a great point, which is probably different than the use case, which is uh, company culture and, and how that can drive. Uh, what you want to use when. Um, there, are, there are companies, there are industries, there are highly regulated in industries that may be highly averse to live communication. Uh, there are others where the CEO believes makes it more accessible, um, that impromptu, you know, ask me a question, I'm there for you. Uh, so certainly I would say, you know, from my experience, if you're in a training environment and it's content that will be used, they'll have a three-month lifespan, six-month lifespan, you're, you're, you're steering towards archive if it's an earnings release or just-in-time information, emergency broadcast, it's live, live webcast. But, I, I mean, I would try and get your finger on the pulse of what your company culture is and try and drive towards that or steer it in a direction that you think it should go uh, as opposed to, you know, maybe the conventional wisdom I would, I would be talking to. Yeah, I'll, I'll say that at, at Accenture we do a lot of live events, and it, it really comes from the perspective of, you know, Accenture's 300,000 people spread in you know, 80 countries or something like that. It's huge. You're, you know, the chances are you're never actually going to be in the same room with the CEO or even your business unit lead. And so the only way you're going to you know, see them live is on the web. Yeah. And because we integrate the telepresence in the VC units, you know, a, a typical live event for us would have... you know. The CEO in Paris and the CFO is in New Jersey and the COO is in Austin, Texas and some other business unit lead is in Bangalore and they're all going to be presenters together on this live event that's going out to a global audience of a couple thousand. And there's no way you would do that type of interaction between leaders and get it out to the employees unless you did it in streaming and you used VC and telepresence together. You just wouldn't do it. It would be too expensive. Yeah, I, I just want to reiterate again, I think that the answer to your question really is a question of culture. I mean, for all the things that um, that's important to us for video, seeing somebody on the screen, um, being able to look them in the eye and see what they're like um, on the video screen, there's another level of that. I think when you're doing a live broadcast, um, it has that sense of immediacy and um, directness um, that may or may not work for your culture. And I think the cool thing about the tools that are coming from vendors like we have up here today, um, it is really easy to measure. Um, and I think it's important for us to go back 
and take a look at those metrics and see, you know, what performs, what type of content performed well, what type of, you know, what isn't performing well, and make those adjustments over the over the lifetime of your program, um, because you know, right now, you know, it's very easy for us to tell, you know, what's working, what's resonating with our community, what do people really like to see, what causes them to come back and watch, what's happening in our videos, which is causing them to drop off, um, you know, all these things, um, you know, are giving big data all this information to give back to us and answer questions just like that for us. Yes? So one more piggyback question. So again, back to the question of tools, how are you guys, you know, what are you using to get that, to get that, that those analytics back? Or is it, is it, um, in, it, is it part of the solution you're using or is it different? So we're doing, I think, I would say that we're doing two things. We're using the, we're using the analytics that come with a lot of our vendor tools. Um, so with our lecture capture, um, with our YouTube um, initiatives, we're definitely going back and looking at things like viewership, stickiness, um, how many times um, particular people are coming back and watching. We are actually taking that data out of those systems and doing big data analysis on them to really figure out um, what works for people and what doesn't um, for initiatives, both inside and outside the enterprise. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, Michael, you can probably talk to this, but there's a wealth of data that is coming from uh, the video vendors right now. Um, and it's something that you should look for as you're talking to new vendors or new SaaS providers, um, is the ability to pull that data out and, and really look at it and take heart to it to really understand fundamentally how people are consuming your content. And uh, so, sorry to cut us off, but we are actually at past. We're past the end of our time, so I'm sure you know, we'll be happy to take some more questions afterwards here, but uh, I'll let them get the room ready for the next session. So thank you very much. It's been, uh, been a great session, great questions. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for the panel. Thank you,